Who's excited for the Easter season coming up upon us? Man, it's gonna be powerful. I've always found it's, uh, Easter's always the easiest invitation. Springtime, people are, they're opening up their hearts to, to hear about God, and we wanna just encourage all of you, find someone to bring to some of our Easter services. Next week, we have Palm Sunday. It's gonna be a powerful message by Pastor Luke. Following week, we have no midweek service. We have a Friday, Good Friday service. Beautiful, right here at the Phoenix campus. And then Sunday, we have sunrise, regular services, you name it. Make sure you're bringing someone new to encounter God. Make sure you're challenging yourself to get out of your comfort zone and say, I can't just have all this good stuff to myself, but I gotta share it. Does that make sense, everybody out there? This is an Easter season full of invitations. It's gonna be so good. But honestly, it still feels a little crazy to think that it's Easter already. <laughs> like, I can't be the only one who feels like New Year's and Christmas was like a week ago. And it's just like, you know, they say time flies when you're having fun, and it's true. But one of the best uh, parts I've discovered about working in ministry has to be that church never ends. Some of you are like, yeah, don't remind me. No, come on. <laughs> but the good times never end. The amazing conferences, the amazing performances, the amazing pieces we do don't have to end. The powerful encounters with God the break that we have doing life with you all in the church and partnering with you, it doesn't have to end. You will not find anywhere in scripture that it says that, and when you get to heaven or when you're with God, the good times fade. All we hear about in scripture is how there's a never ending celebration, there's a never ending party, there's never ending rejoicing when we have God. Can I get a quick amen? Start off the service with an amen. We're in the first week of our Easter trilogy and I'm very excited about the word the Lord has given me because I think it sets the stage for the weeks to come very well. Uh, before I go any further, would you guys please bow your heads and join me as we invite the Holy Ghost into this service. To Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for the word you gave me. Father, pray that as I open my mouth, let your word come out, your word with the power to heal, your word with the power to inspire, to challenge, to change, to redirect a life. Father, I pray that those in this crowd can open up their hearts to receive your word, that they might act upon it. And in Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. amen. It's gonna be a good morning. We're gonna start off this sermon in the Gospel of Luke, chapter nine, verses seven through nine. It'll be on the screen behind me, but I'm gonna read it. Now, Herod the Tetrarch heard of all that was happening, and he was greatly perplexed, because it was said by some that John had risen from the dead, and by some that Elijah had appeared, and by others that one of the prophets of old had risen again. Herod said, I myself had John beheaded, but who is this man about whom I hear such things? And he kept trying to see him. The context of this uh, verse we just read is that Jesus has just sent his disciples out two by two, and they're operating in Jesus' authority. They're healing the sick, they're casting out demons, they're promoting the kingdom of God wherever they went. Now Jesus gave the apostles his authority, and they were doing these works in Jesus' name. So Jesus' name and his fame began to spread like crazy. People were excited about Jesus. The buzz even made its way back to the royal palace, where King Herod, who's known as Herod Antipas, was ruling. King Herod hears this buzz about this man that some are claiming to be John the Baptist reborn and he's perplexed because he was the one who had John the Baptist executed. He was the one himself who beheaded John the Baptist. Herod Antipas says the same question all of humanity at some point has asked. Who is this man about whom I hear such things? Friends, the title of the message this morning is called, Who is this Jesus? It's a question a lot of us ask. I couldn't think of a better way to start the Easter season by finding out who Jesus is. In all of human history, there's not a more talked about, learned about, and known about figure than Jesus Christ. But the sad part about life today is that many people know about Jesus rather than knowing Jesus. Many people know of Jesus. Many people like Jesus. In fact, they, they like the idea of Jesus, but they reject the reality of Jesus. Friends, it's not enough just to appreciate Jesus, but do you know Jesus? But Jesus is more than just a cool guy with a long, nice flowing hair and a beard and he can surf without a surfboard. I got a photo for that for y'all. It's coming up. Here it is. I love it. He doesn't need a surfboard. I, like, I had this epiphany years ago. No, I didn't. My buddy bought a t-shirt with that image and we like hung it up on our dorm room in college, like our holy icon, it was just hilarious. But he did not need a surfboard to surf, it's true. But he was more than that. He was more than just a teacher. He was more than just a prophet. Jesus is more than just one of many ways to encounter God. A lot of new age teachers will tell you that many paths can lead to God. But Jesus is the only way to get to God. 
The best place to find out who Jesus is is written in the works written about him and his church by people who directly followed him or came directly after him. Who are the closest sources to Jesus Christ? One of them is Peter. Peter says in Matthew 16, 16, Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. Peter used the word Christ, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew word Messiah, which simply means anointed one, chosen one, the one who will set the Israelites free. John says in John 1, 1, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Jesus was present with God at the start of creation and is himself fully God. Paul says in Colossians 1, 15, Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Jesus is the visible appearance of an invisible God. No one has seen God, but Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. That Jesus Christ is the image of God. John echoes Peter's claim in John 1, 14, when he says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. Jesus Christ is fully God and he came down and became human. That's a core tenet to our Christian faith. So point number one this morning, who is Jesus? Jesus is fully man and fully God. Point number one, Jesus is fully man and fully God. The very first heresy in the early church, a little church history lesson for you. The very first heresy was a heresy called docetism which comes from the Greek word dokesis, which means to seem. As if to say the belief of docetism was that Jesus only seemed to have a real body. He appeared as a man, but he really wasn't a man. He was only God, that he was only God and not man. But our Bible teaches us that Jesus was flesh. He was human. He bled, he sweat, he cried, he was thirsty, he was hungry. He even got mad at his mom for telling him what to do. If that doesn't sound like humanity, then I don't know what does. Getting mad at your parents. Come on, somebody. But Jesus Christ was fully man. The main issue with the heresy of docetism is, if Jesus wasn't human, then he really couldn't have died for our sins. Where this fell flat was that if Jesus Christ wasn't a human, he was not able to die in our place. It was the spirit of God that caused Mary to become pregnant. But our entire religion hangs upon the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. The idea that Jesus wasn't human is in line with what Paul calls in 1 Timothy 4.1, the doctrine of demons. Any like teaching, theology that goes against Jesus' divinity and Jesus' humanity is a doctrine of demons. It's designed to take you away from God. But Jesus being fully man does not limit him from being fully God. See, since Jesus was born of a woman, he's man. And he was God since he was born of the Spirit of God. You know, Jesus' mom was Mary and she became pregnant by the Spirit of God. But Jesus' father was God, which is why Jesus routinely calls God Father, and he tells us to do the same. Friends, one of the greatest revelations that comes out of Jesus' humanity is the idea that we get to call God Father. Far too often people struggle to relate to God as Father. For some it can be scary or uncomfortable or seem out of place for such a powerful and holy being. Yet Jesus Christ himself tells us to call God Father in the Lord's Prayer. I've got to tell you, there's a secret anointing and blessing that can only be reached once you pivot from seeing God as almighty smiter in the sky to father, to dad. When we begin to view God as father, we gain the ability to freely receive grace and mercy from sin and not abuse grace as a license to sin. I have encountered this idea myself personally just a few years ago. I remember I was still the youth pastor. I was just praying to God. It's like the new year. I was praying to God, God, give me fresh vision fresh anointing. God, I pray that you'll use me to do big things. And I was asking for all this new stuff for the year. But as I kept praying, I began just saying in my humbleness saying, God, I can't believe you'd use a wretch like me. Oh God, I'm just a dirty rag before you. Oh God, I'm just a broken vessel. I can't believe you'd choose me. There surely was someone else you could use. I can't believe you used me. God, I'm just grateful. I'll never forget, God literally shut my mouth straight up. I'm not even messing. I was like, ah. I was like, no, no, no. I was like, what the heck's going on? And God spoke to me in my mind. He said, Ash, why do you sound like such a loser? And at first I was like, um, ouch. Okay, thanks, by the way, God, that wasn't very nice. But he was like, why do you sound like such a loser? And I was like, um, well, first off, in the Bible it says that I am a dirty rag. And what could I have to barter with Almighty God? So take that. And he says, that's true. And I was like, ouch, okay, thanks. What's the whole point of this therapy session? He said, that's true. But that's not what my word says. And I was like, God, I have read the Bible. In case you didn't know, it's part of my job. I said, that is what your word says. But he says, who is the word? Friends, I gotta tell you, God doesn't ask a question because he doesn't know the answer. He sets you up. He says, who is the word? And I said, well, the word is Jesus Christ. He says, what does my word 
say about you? I began to read the Gospel of John. I saw that Jesus was willing to meet me, to heal me, to cleanse me, to forgive me. He was even willing to die for me. After I began to view Jesus and God as my father, as I began to view God as my father, I began to understand that my ability to forgive myself increased. I was so good at making fun of myself, at self-loathing, at knowing I was a dirty rag, at not feeling valuable in the eyes of God. I was probably the best at it. That wasn't what God called me to do. That wasn't why God saved me. God didn't save me, show me grace and heal me so I could stay in a place of insecurity. He did it so I could be set free. Friends, I gotta tell you. Come on, that's good. Praise God. Jesus told me to call God Father. And so I remember I repented. I said, God, I'm so sorry, I doubt. I said, I will call you Father. And even today to this prayer, I pray, Father, I thank you. Father, will you please bless me? But since then, I found my heart for God has grown. My ability to forgive myself for my past mistakes has grown. Even my boldness in prayer has grown because I know my earthly dad loves me. He's a good person, Pastor Jurgen. He's an awesome guy. But I gotta tell you, I'm bold enough and still not ashamed enough that I will ask my dad for money still. <laughs> when he comes to visit me and we go out to eat and the bill comes, and I'm just like, it's right there. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Which you think I gotta get better at. But I am unapologetically comfortable asking my dad for things because I know he loves me. Friends, I've gotta tell you, when I pivoted to seeing God as father, I became bold in my prayer saying, God, I know my life is short right now, but you can provide and prosper me. God, I know I'm needing a miracle right now, and I come boldly to the throne that you can not only meet my need, but exceed it. I can receive healing. I can receive blessing. I can receive forgiveness because I'm bold with my dad. It's the same thing we have. Are you bold in your prayers or are you timid? Because he's your father. If you're timid, I have to ask, well, do you view God as a smiter who wants to judge or as a father who wants to bless? You know, people make the claim that viewing God as Father makes you fear Him less and abuse His grace. But I found the opposite. When I was little, it sounds so cliche. My dad would, my dad's a cliche man. He's hilarious. He's the book of cliches. You've got cliche in the dictionary. My dad's face is right there. He's, he's funny. My dad was that cliche dad who I've, you know, I've messed up, done the wrong thing. And he just put his hand on my shoulder and say, Son, I'm not mad. I'm just disappointed. He would say that all the time. And as a son, that would literally send like a knife through my heart. I'd be like, Oh, Dad, I'm so sorry. I found that I wanted nothing more than to make my dad proud. I wanted nothing more than for my dad to say, well done, son. And I've got to say, as I began to see God as my father, it was the exact same thing. I didn't want to abuse his grace, but I wanted to use grace to go back to him. I've got to say, if they tell you it cause you to abuse grace, I would just say respectfully that I think they're wrong. I think they're misplaced. Seeing God as my father makes me want to be even more devout to him. But God is not just some supreme being in the sky. He's our dad, I've said that. And we discover that through the humanity of Jesus. No other religion can say the same because no other religion has the real Jesus. We can only view God as father because Jesus came as a human. Every other religion has their God as this uninvolved, cynical, cold-hearted God who doesn't care what happens. It's the same with Greek mythology, Roman mythology, same with Islam. All these other religions, the God does not care what happens to people. You'll never find in the Quran, and Muslims call Allah Father, since he's not the true God. Muslims in the religion of Islam have no proper understanding of God, since they have no proper understanding of Jesus. Muslims like to claim that Jesus was indeed human in the Quran, he was very special, but they refuse to call him God. They think it's blasphemy to call Jesus God, and oftentimes if you ever see a Muslim street preacher, he'll always say, tell me in the Bible where Jesus says he's God, to hold up a Bible. And where in the Bible does Jesus claim to be God? They're they're blind, they can't see it. Jesus himself claims to be God throughout the Bible. And here are just two examples for you when you find it in scripture. In John 10, 30, Jesus says, I and the Father are one. We are one and the same. The Greek word for one literally translates as a single entity or alike. He's saying the Father and myself are the exact same. We are holy God together. But probably the most compelling argument for Jesus claiming to be God is found in John 8, 58 through 59. While Jesus is arguing with the Pharisees, Jesus says to the Pharisees, Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and when he saw me, he was glad in it. And the Pharisees are like, what the heck are you talking about, bro? What type of food did you eat last night? You're not even 50 years old, and you claim to have seen Abraham? You're filled with demons. They mocked him. But Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. That's all he said. 
So the Pharisees picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. The term I am is said intentionally because that's the name of the Hebrew, that's the Hebrew name of God, and it's Yahweh. When Moses was found God in the burning bush, and God said, Moses, I want you to lead my people out of slavery. He says, well, when I get there, who will I tell them sent me? What's your name? I just came from Egypt where they worship Ra, the sun. What is your name? And God simply responds by saying, I am. It was no mistake then that Jesus announced to these people the words, I am. It wasn't just a coincidence. I am was the name of God and belonged to God alone. Now we know that Jesus is inferring himself to be God since the Pharisees understood it and sought to stone him, which was the punishment given for blasphemy, for degrading God's name, for trying to become God. The Pharisees understood that Jesus was claiming to be God, yet we have a whole religion that refuses to see the light. If a human were to say he was God, that would degrade God's holiness. But thankfully, Jesus Christ wasn't a human, or he was, wasn't just a human. He was fully God. Jesus is fully man, and he's fully God. But it's for our benefit that Jesus is human, because he's the only God who can relate to his creation. Jesus Christ is the only God who can relate to his creation. Years ago, I was in a debate with a Muslim man about, you know, he was like, why would you serve Jesus if Jesus is a creative being? You know, and he mentioned Colossians 1.15, the firstborn of all creation. I said that Jesus had to be born for our atonement and his destiny to be our atonement was what was created. Jesus always lived, but his destiny to die for me started when humanity started. He wouldn't need to die if I never lived. That just wouldn't make any sense. The Muslim man said, you can't serve a human since a human is weak and inferior. And I said, really? And I said, well, that's interesting to me. The Holy Spirit guided me and told me to ask him if Allah had ever felt thirsty or hungry. He said, no. I said, has Allah ever felt betrayed by family and friends? He said, no. I said, does Allah know what it's like to experience pain or death? He said, no, of course not. He said, Allah is strong and supreme. I responded by saying, so you're telling me that he's incomplete. So you're telling me there's things he has no understanding of. You're telling me he's not all-knowing since he has no idea what that's like. I said, Allah is not a God. In fact, he's an abomination. He's man's attempt at God. He's a false God and Islam is demonic. The Muslim didn't really have to respond to me after that, let me tell you. Sometimes you gotta be a little bold with the people you're talking to. But what makes me embrace Jesus as a man is because Jesus is so unique that he's the only God. He's the only God in every religion across all ends of the earth who can look at his creation dead in the eyes and say, I know what it feels like. No other religion can a God look at you and say, I know what it's like to be hungry. I know what it's like to be thirsty. I know what it's like to doubt who is around you. I know what it's like to be betrayed. I know what it's like to feel pain. There's only one God who can relate to you on a human level, and it's because we have a God who is fully God and he was fully human. Can I get an amen in the house of God this morning? You will not find another God who knows exactly what it's been like, and he knows the exact answer that you need. You see, Jesus not only saves us, but he gets us. Jesus gets us, which is, you know, I don't mind the attempt of the he gets us commercials. I think they could change their approach, but it's true. Jesus Christ gets us. He actually gets us. It's for our benefit that Jesus left heaven and became man. That way he can be our savior. That was the only way we can enter into relationship with God. Friends, we won the battle over Satan and death when he humbled himself and became flesh. The humanity of Jesus opened the door for all of us to gain access to God in heaven. Jesus is fully man and fully God, but he's also more than just our God. Point number two, point number two, my Lord and my God. Point number two is my Lord and my God. In the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verse 28, Thomas the disciple, after seeing the fully resurrected Jesus manifest before him, exclaimed out loud that he is my Lord and my God. At that point in time beforehand, eight days earlier, Mary Magdalene came to the disciples and said, I saw a resurrected Jesus, he's alive. And Thomas said, right, sure. Again, what were you eating last night? I think you're a little loco in La Cabeza. He says, unless I see Jesus in front of me and I put my finger in the stab wounds, then I'll believe. He says, I have to see it, then I'll believe it. Eight days later, all the homies, all the disciples are eating chicken wings and watching TV in the room and Jesus appeared to them out of nowhere. Jesus looks at Thomas, he says, Thomas, put your finger here. Stop doubting and believe. Upon seeing that, Thomas exclaimed, my Lord and my God. Notice how Thomas had two separate titles, my Lord and my God. 
These are two different roles with unique characteristics for our relationship with him. Jesus is both Lord, judge, and God, creator and savior. It's not enough just to love Jesus as our creator, but we have to have a holy fear of him as a judge. I'm reading a book right now, and this, uh, it's a, from a pastor, it's a pastor's book, and he was sharing a story of when he was just a young pastor in ministry. And I'm not gonna say names, but there was a very famous preacher back in the 80s, 90s who was in jail because he defrauded people of millions and millions of dollars. He had multiple affairs. It was a horrific attack on the Christian church. But this young preacher was doing such a good job preaching that this preacher who was now in jail, the older preacher, asked if he would come visit him in jail. The young preacher was like, wow, me? Like, I get a chance to talk to this guy and you know, maybe witness to him right now. So he went. And they're talking, the young preacher finally goes to the jail. He's talking to the older preacher. And they're making pleasantries, they're making small talk, but halfway through, the, the young preacher looked at the older preacher and said, how could you do it? How could you defraud all these people? How, how could you cheat on your wife like that? Didn't you love Jesus? The older pastor said, there wasn't a day in my life where I didn't love Jesus. But he said, when I was at the top, I stopped fearing God. That was a powerful story that when I read it, impacted me. He was able to accomplish many things because he loved Jesus, but he wasn't able to stay there because he stopped fearing God. Friends, I gotta tell you, we have to see God as Lord and God. We see Jesus as Lord and God. Can I get an amen this morning? When you love Jesus, but no longer have holy fear and reverence of him, you begin to get comfortable with sin. How do I know you're comfortable with sin? You begin to make excuses for it. You begin to try to justify it in your life. Well, well you don't understand, Pastor. My, my, my wife isn't intimate with me. We well, don't understand. This man defrauded me of money, so I'm just taking back what's mine. We well, don't understand. They never asked for forgiveness, so I'm not going to give it to them. You seek to make excuses and justify the sin that you're living with. You go from stumbling or tripping over sin, which we're all imperfect. We're going to stumble or trip. We're going to make mistakes. You go from making a mistake to living with a mistake to having that sin with you daily. And we know that Jesus loves us, forgives us, and has grace for us, but we begin to forget that at some point, he does have to issue judgment on us. See, we can get comfortable living in sin when we get comfortable with God. Don't ever get too comfortable with God that we forget to give him the honor and reverence he deserves since he's holy. My wife is so good at this. I'm a guy, I like to push boundaries, I like to have a little fun. And oftentimes in doing that, I can cross over and get comfortable with God and thank God for my wife. Can I get a quick amen for my beautiful wife, Aubrey? She is that like, if it was a cartoon, she is that type of person who would yank me by my collar and just ring me back because I can get comfortable with God. But she's in my life, thankfully, for more than just this reason, but she is to help me stay rooted that I can never get too comfortable with holy God. See, we as Christians can get caught up in all sorts of sins when we only operate out of love for Jesus and not holy reverence when we see Jesus as only our savior and not as our Lord. We see this with Peter. Peter loved Jesus. He said, Jesus, even if everybody else were to leave you, I would never leave you, no matter what. We see in that same chapter in the Bible that Peter denied knowing Jesus three separate times. He denied even knowing Jesus. Why? Because he feared man more than he feared God. Peter would have never thought he would ever get to that point to deny Jesus. But because he stopped fearing God and he started fearing man more than God, he was able to do a thing he never even thought he could do. But conversely, we as Christians can get caught up in all sorts of pharisaical or self-righteous sins when we only operate out of holy reverence and not love. We see Jesus as almighty smiter and not loving savior. I gotta tell you friends this morning, a little Bible lesson, it wasn't the demons who handed Jesus over to be executed. It was the Pharisees. It was the self-righteous crowd were the ones who were chanting, crucify him. The self-righteous people were the ones who handed Jesus over. They claimed to love the law of God so much they were willing to kill someone for it. They claimed they were trying to protect the law, but the Bible says the Pharisees met and sought a way to kill Jesus. They were willing to break the law to appear to keep the law. They were more concerned with self-image than they were with Jesus' lordship. Again, we see that if you fear man more than you fear the Lord, you end up going against your core beliefs in ways you've never thought you could. Jesus is Lord and he is God. We need to see him as both in our lives. Then we can operate in full capacity of our calling in him. See, God wants to be my friend and to operate out of a relationship of love, 
But as I said earlier, he's my father first and he has to be my Lord. My dad would, you know, my dad, like I say, he's cliche. My dad would say to me all the time, son, I love nothing more than to be your friend. We're great buddies. But at the end of the day, I'm still your dad and I have to do things. I never forget, it's like I'm 12 and I was at my buddy's birthday party. We were at the park playing football, baseball, just having a great time, enjoying good old American fun. But I remember I had Little League practice that day for Little League Baseball and I purposefully didn't remind my dad because I knew if I did, then he'd take me from the party and I'd have to leave. So I was sneaky, I was a very sneaky kid. And so I didn't tell him. I just remember like we're going to the party. I knew practice started in five minutes, but I didn't see my dad. I was like, I got off scot-free. The perfect crime, a victimless crime, I might add. But I remember, I'll never forget, I just, I, I'm playing. I just see like the like tires, just hear like this, boom. And if you've ever driven with my dad, you'll know that's how he drives. Reckless, it's hilarious. I was like, oh no, that's my dad. It's like the, the, the steps of, you know, the giant in Jack and the Beanstalk. I was like, oh no. <laughs> but I never forget, he comes and says, son, we gotta go to practice. And I was like, dad, bro, like, I'm with my friends, like, come on, hey, let this one slide. Like, I'm doing good in food, I'm impressing them. And it got to the point where I was literally crying, like, dad, don't take me. I was like, you're embarrassing me. He was like, son, you are embarrassing yourself, 100. Let's just get that clear. You are embarrassing yourself. But I forget, my dad told me, he said, son, I'm so glad you're having fun, but you made a commitment to your team and you have to see it through. In that moment, my dad was no longer my friend, but he was my father. And it's the same thing that God does for us. And I can't, say, I can't wait to do the same to Joel one day. I can't wait to say that to Joel with a big smile on my face and say, it's good to be the dad now. <laughs> but it's the same with God. There are moments God wants nothing more than to be in relationship with you. But at the end of the day, he has to be God. He has to be the father. Friends, I fully agree with Pastor Joel Osteen that God wants to prosper you. God wants to bless you, but not at the expense of his word not at the point of disobedience to him. God can't transgress his law since he is truth and justice, not even for love. You see, Jesus Christ is my Lord and my God. We can never forget that God has to be in his proper place in his life as holy God, that God is worthy of all my praise. That leads me to the final point this morning, point number three. Jesus is the only one worthy of it all. Jesus is the only one Oh, come on, yeah, that's good. That's a good point right there. Jesus is the only one worthy of it all. Revelations 5, 12 says, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. I love this verse because it doesn't make grammatical sense. There's too many ands, not enough commas, but they're willing to break grammar to give God glory. Come on, somebody, these are people I can get behind. That was a verse depicting what it's gonna look like in heaven someday. When we're in heaven, we will sing for all eternity about how Jesus is worthy of it all. But I've gotta tell you, that means that if our job is to bring heaven to earth, our life on earth has to reflect that. Where Jesus really is worthy of it all. Where he's worthy of all you can do. We need to be fully devoted to God in our lives. To not serve God on Sundays and then serve our flesh on Mondays to not be in a small group on Tuesday and then in the bar getting hammered on a Wednesday. But it's, it's $1 drink Wednesday. It's like, that's awesome. We can just get the nachos, <laughs> get the water. It's free, right? We can't go halfway with God and expect it to be all good. That's kind of what we do. And we kind of think, you know, if I go halfway, God will cover the rest. Uh-uh. We can't go halfway with God and expect it to be all good. We can't obey Jesus only when we feel like it. I've got to tell you, partial obedience is disobedience. All the moms in here said a big amen. Let me just tell you. Partial obedience is still disobedience. I have just a very kind of, you know, it's an example from my childhood. It's a kitty example, but it's true. When I was little, my mom would often tell me, son, your room is so messy, you need to clean it. That's how she talks, true story, <laughs> I'm kidding. But she was like, your room is so messy, you need to clean it. So I, an intellectual, knew my bed had a loft underneath for storage. So what I would do is I would just get all my mess and just do like a nice clean sweep and put it right under the bed. And then again, I was a sneaky kid. I had a big you know, bed quilt and I would put the quilt over onto the ground so she couldn't see it. Again, a victimless crime, mind you. But my mom would come in and she was smarter than I was. In fact, she probably still is. And she, as soon as she'd come in, she would walk right to the bed and I'm like sweating. I'm like, oh no, my plan. And she would just lift up the bed and say, like, you know, I maybe can't say this when I church. you knucklehead, that's what I'll say. And then she would give me a quick smack to the bottom. <laughs> that's, that's how my mom rolled. It was very quick, very swift and very deliberate. Why? Because my room was clean, 
But the mess wasn't taken care of. I had partially obeyed her in the fact my room was clean, but it did not go all the way and fix the mess. I know that was a kiddie example, but it's true with God. What are the areas of your life? You've gone halfway with God, thinking, hey, this will satisfy you, God, but he's asked for more. But look at my room's clean. Look at this, I dress well when I go to church, despite the fact you've got hate on the inside of you. What are those things that you've given God? Partial obedience. You see, it's the same thing with God. This is with my relationship with my mom. Same thing with God. And we see it play out in scripture. In 1 Samuel 13, we encounter the story of King Saul being sent on a mission by God to completely destroy the Amalekites. Saul defeats the Amalekites, but instead of completely wiping them out, he keeps the king as his prisoner. Back then in ancient history, if, if a king were to go to war and beat the other king, oftentimes he would kind of wound or maim the other king, keep him alive and have him be a servant in his house. It's like a trophy. As like, look at all the people I've conquered. This is my long list of achievements. Saul kept this king alive as a trophy to his accomplishment. He used the mission of God to backstroke his own ego. But it goes a step further. God told Saul, completely wipe out the Amalekites and all their livestock, spare nothing. But the Bible records that Saul kept the best of the livestock alive. And when the prophet Samuel meets up with him, he says, why did you keep these alive? He said, well, that's a good question. He said, I love God so much that I kept these alive because I wanna give a big sacrifice to him. Now notice he says, I want to give a big sacrifice to him. Saul wanted to do this big sacrifice so people would see how holy he was. He wanted to put the front that he was a man of God. He wanted to boost his own street cred. We're gonna pick up the story in 1 Samuel 13, 22. Tell me, Samuel said. That's how you know he was ticked. Does the Lord really want sacrifices and offerings? No. He doesn't want your sacrifices. He wants you to obey him. I never forget, I was talking to this guy. He says, why do you preach from the Bible? And I said, because the Bible works, first and foremost. When I read scripture, it speaks to me, it works. Saul thought that he could serve God and boost his ego at the same time. Saul thought that if he gave God a gift in the midst of his disobedience, God would still bless him. Samuel told him, nothing you can give God is worth more to him than complete obedience. Friends, I gotta tell you, God won't ever be pleased or honored by the fruit we produce in disobedience. God won't be pleased or honored by the fruit that we produce if it's in disobedience. See, Jesus is worthy of all our lives, not just the parts we wanna give to him. We can't claim to live for Jesus while we're serving ourselves. Probably one of the scariest verses in the entire Bible is found in the Gospel of Matthew. A lot of us might even have read this before. It's Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, do we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. That was what happened. Jesus himself says that there will be people who believe in me, who attend church, who work on the parking team even when it's cold. They've even got the church merch. They've got the ripped jeans. They're doing everything for God. They're living for God. They even prophesy in his name, pray in his name. But Jesus says they won't be allowed to enter into heaven. Friends, it's not that they didn't look the part. It's not they didn't talk the part. It's not that they even didn't do certain things Jesus asked them to do. But Jesus says they practiced lawlessness and that he had no relationship with them because of it. But how do we know if we practice lawlessness? It's if the words you speak don't match up with the life you live. How do you know if that's you? If the words you speak to God when no one else is around does not match the life you live for God when everyone's around. If you declare that you sold out for Jesus, but you're gonna keep these offenses buried in your heart and not forgive people who wronged you because they don't deserve it, that's going against what God said. Or perhaps you've given the Lord all of your life except for your sexual desire and your sexual freedom and going against the way God made you and the way God has hardwired this world. Or perhaps you even serve and you're dedicated to the house of God, but you refuse to tithe because you say, I earned that money. With whose breath? <laughs> Who 
who gave you that breath. We begin to say all these great things for God, except this one little area. It'll be a sad day in the end when there are people who lived for Jesus on the outside, but lived without Jesus on the inside. You don't get into heaven by works, but it's by faith alone, so no one can boast. There's a very famous quote that I love, and ever since I read it uh, a year ago, it's just impacted me, by this man named James Hudson Taylor. He was a Christian missionary to China in the 1800s. He spent 54 years preaching the gospel in China. He gave God his life to preach the gospel. And he said this. He said, if Jesus is not Lord of all, then he's not your Lord at all. He says, if you go 99% of the way with Jesus, then he's not really your Lord. This man backed up, you know, his life matched up his talk. He gave his whole life to spread the gospel to ancient China, 1800s. If Jesus is not Lord of all, then he's not your Lord at all. And I'll close with this story. Remember my dad told me this years ago at the dinner table, my life is just a collection of moments where my dad spoke and I listened. Come on somebody, it's good. I'll never forget the story my dad told me of back in like the late 80s, early 90s, uh, this man wanted to invest in a property in Beverly Hills a nice part of town. He found a house that was on one of the hills that overlooked the whole cityscape of Los Angeles. He said, this is the house I'm gonna buy. He walked up to the man, he said, hey, I pulled some comps. Your house is worth this much. I wanna pay you two times the amount for the house. I wanna make it worth your while to sell it to me. I believe in it. The man said, wow, this is pretty much an offer I can't refuse. Let's, let's make a deal. We'll go to the negotiation table. The new owner is pumped. He's like, yes, praise God. They go to the contract negotiations and the old owner of the house says, hey, you can have the house. My wife died tragically years ago of a heart attack. We were hanging something on our house and she put this nail in the house right when it happened. It's the last memory I have of her. You can have the whole house, but you can't, just don't touch this nail. Just give me that nail. The new owner's like, um, heck yeah, that's the easiest trade deal ever. He's like, give it to me, give me, give me, give me, give me the house. So life goes on. Five years later, the housing market booms. His house is now worth six times its original price. Six times its original price. He's living good. He's got his wife in there. They're starting to just enjoy life. And the old, one day, knock, knock, knock. He opens the door. It's the old owner. He says, hey, I've brought the original value of what the house was worth. I want to buy it back from you. He said, the original value? First of all, I bought it for two times the value. And now it's worth six times the original value. He says, unless you meet me there, then I'm not going to give you that. He says, I'm only going to buy it for the original price. The new owner just slammed the door in his face like, what the heck is with this guy? Next morning, he wakes up and there's just a horrible smell. The man begins to check like the, the vents, all these things. Like, where is, maybe it's like the Chinese food I left out last night, nothing. He opens his door to see there was a dead, rotting pig's carcass hanging in that nail. The guy was like, what the heck? So he took it off, threw it out. He's like, what? And then the old owner of the house, five minutes later, came up to him and says, hey, why'd you remove my pig? He says, because it's stinking up my house. You're ruining my life. He says, this nail belongs to me. You can't remove that pig. The new owner was like, what are you talking about? He called his lawyer friend and said, this guy's putting a pig on this nail. I said he could have the nail. I couldn't touch the nail. But, but surely there's laws against this kind of thing. The lawyer looked at it, examined it. He says, actually, because of the wording of this contract, you cannot remove anything on that nail. You have to let him do it. The new owner was just disgusted. He said, I'm not gonna give up without a fight. He refused, he refused. After three weeks of every single day, the smell ruining the house, the man's wife said, I've had enough. You need to sell this house. We have to leave. The man goes to the old owner. He says, hey, could you please just meet me at three times what the house was worth originally? I'll give you a great deal. He said, no, I'm buying it for the original price it was worth five years ago. The man had to sell that house. He lost everything. He lost all of his work. Friends, I gotta tell you, if you give the devil just one nail in your life, he can use it to take everything. If you give the devil just one spot in your life, he can use it to remove a life of hard work. I gotta tell you friends, Jesus isn't asking for complete obedience because he's insecure and he wants constant affirmation. He's asking for complete obedience because he knows what happens when we don't. Jesus Christ knows he's Lord, whether you acknowledge it or not. He knows he's God, he's confident. 
But Jesus knows the power of leaving just a small crack, leaving just one nail for the devil. He knows how a small sin can turn into a big sin and completely ruin all that we've done. But I can tell you the best part about Jesus, the best part about our God, is that even if we have allowed the devil to set up a nail in our house, even if we have sinned and grieved God's law, he can remove it and restore us. But all it takes is repentance. Repentance simply means that you change your mind. You change your mind, but God will change your heart. Proverbs 28, 13. He who covers his sins will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will find mercy. That's God's word. Friends, Jesus already came down from heaven to pay the price for your sin. Now you just have to accept it. I've got to tell you, Jesus already gave all of him. The question is now, will you give him all of you? If I could have everybody right now, just bow their heads and close their eyes. A moment between you and God. No one's looking around. No judgment. If you're here, and perhaps you've never even known Jesus. You've heard the name. You've watched the news. But you never knew that Jesus Christ was fully man and fully God. Or perhaps you never knew that, yes, he's God, but he's also Lord. Perhaps you've never known that, or maybe you did, and you got caught up in the ways of the world and you've walked away from that. And you're saying, Ash, that's me. Could you pray that I get reunited with Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior? For the first time and the first time in a long time, if that's you this morning, with every head bowed and every eye closed, a moment between you and God, I'm gonna count to three. And if that's you on the count of three, just lift up your hands so I know who to pray for. A moment with you and God. One, two, three. Lift up those hands. Thank you right there. I see that hand. Thank you right there. I see that hand. Thank you. I see that hand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. I see that hand. Thank you. I see that hand. Thank you at the back. I see that hand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I see that hand. Thank you. I see that hand. Thank you. I see those hands. Thank you right there. Thank you on the balcony. I see those hands. Thank you right here. I see that hand. You can put down your hands and just keep your eyes bowed. Keep your eyes closed and heads bowed. If I could have everybody repeat after me, I'm going to lead us in what's called the prayer of redemption. We were sinners, but we were redeemed, bought in full by Christ's blood. If I could have everybody repeat after me in this house, everybody say, Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your son Jesus to leave heaven, to come to earth, to be a human, and to die on the cross for my sins. Lord Jesus, today, I choose to love you. I choose to serve you all the days of my life. In Jesus' mighty name, Amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. I've got one more appeal I'd love to make this morning. Again, if I could have everybody bow their heads and close their eyes, I want to keep this moment intimate. As I was preaching, perhaps there is something on the inside of you that you know is preventing you from being all out. Perhaps it's an unforgiveness you have for someone who's wronged you. Perhaps it's sexual sin that you can't shake free from. Perhaps not trusting God with your finances, thinking that you are a self-made man. You're saying, Pastor Rush, there's a nail in my life and I need to have it removed. Can you pray for me that not only will I remove it, but God will help me ensure it never comes back in. If that's you this morning, with every head bowed and every eye closed, you wanna make that confession and find repentance. I've gotta tell you, Jesus is quick to forgive all sins. The only sin he can't forgive is the one you don't confess. Don't leave here without confessing that sin. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you've got to sit in this place on the count of three, just lift up your hands so I know who to pray for. I know who to ask God to descend upon. One, two, three. Lift up those hands in this place. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I see that hand. Thank you. Hands up everywhere. Thank you. 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 Hands everywhere. Thank you. Oh my goodness. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. Praise God. Praise God. Just keep your eyes closed as you amen this prayer that I have to God. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, that you are quick to forgive. There is no sin, past, present, or future, that you cannot atone for, that you cannot rectify with the blood of Jesus Christ. Father, I thank you that right now all these nails are being removed. The nail of shame, the nail of fear of man, the nail of fear of rejection, the nail of sexual immorality, the nail of denying Christ's lordship, the nail of not trusting God with finances. All of these nails, God, I pray that they are removed and that they get replaced by habits rooted in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Father, pray for healing over these people, that you will forgive them and pray that they can forgive themselves and move forward in life. In Jesus' mighty name, everybody said, Amen. Who enjoyed church this morning? 
Man, praise God. We serve the one true God. If I could have everybody stand right now before we dismiss, I would love to bless you. Don't forget, next week is Palm Sunday. Challenge yourself. Invite someone to church. Whether it's the barista at coffee, whether it's a neighbor who lives in you, whether it's a workmate, just say, could you please go to church with me? I'll buy you lunch afterwards. If you need money, come find me. I'll pay for that lunch. Come on, somebody. But who would like to be blessed this morning? Lift up your hands and receive a blessing from God. May the Lord bless you and may He keep you. May He make His face to shine upon you. May that if God is for you, who can be against you? If God's on your side, whom shall you fear? I pray that you'll be above and not beneath, the head and not the tail. You'll find blessing and no longer shall struggle. I pray you'll be blessed going into a season and blessed leaving one. I pray that you can see the fingerprints of God in all that you do. And I pray that whatever you do, say it with me, it shall prosper. God bless you, church.